Now we get to what I find is one of the core elements here, namely the Kalman filter. And first, I'll just present it and state it, and then we'll get back to the details later. Um, so we have to get some initial estimates of where we are at time zero, so that we can make a prediction of what is our expectation at time one. That's the mean value of the process. It's a vector in general. What is the covariance of our one-step prediction to time one, given information to time zero? That's the kind of the background knowledge. And then how is the uncertainty or the covariance of the observation matrix there, which is C times the covariance of xx at time t equal to 1 given t equal to 0, and C transpose plus the covariance matrix. So let's just take this one and look at that. Given that we know the state and the covariance of x, and we have that this is what we have as the observation equation, if you look at the variance of y, well, what we have is a constant matrix multiplied on x plus some noise. So when you take a constant and multiply that on a covariant, on, on a variable well here as a vector, you have to pre-multiply with the constant and then post-multiply by, by the transpose. And then we have to add the covariance for the measurement error out here as well. So this part here is kind of very easy to understand. and it's the same, this is actually a prediction. So let's start from the bottom here and look at the prediction part, and we have the exact same equation down here, just for generic fitting at all time points that we have to deal with. So to do the prediction for the state, we have an estimate of where we were previously, and then some input and some noise. So it's quite obvious that the expectation out here is using an expectation value of the noise of zero, and then just saying that the x hat at time t plus one given t is the coefficient matrix A times the estimate of x t given t. That means information of the st system state given observations up to and including time t plus b times the input. And the covariance here is very similar to what you have for y. You have an initial covariance matrix for x, and then you multiply that by an a here, which means that you have to pre-multiply by a and post-multiply by the transpose of a when you go for the covariance, plus you have the system noise because we assume that the input is known and there's no noise from there. So the prediction part here is fairly straightforward. The reconstruction part is a little bit more demanding to understand, but for now, before we get into the details, let me just explain. So you have the prediction of xt given t minus 1 times c. So this is the predicted value of yt. So we have the one-step prediction error here that we use. We want to use that to update when we get the observation yt. We want to use that to update our prediction at xt given t minus 1 to get xt given t. And there we have a so-called Kalman gain, which is essentially a fraction between what is the variance of the system state over what is the variance of the observation. Effectively, this is just a weighted sum of two normal distributions that are wrapped in a lot of indexing. Um, and then the covariance of xt given t is the predicted covariance minus the information that you get from the observation. So that's the background. If you want to do multi-step predictions in a Kalman filter, then you have to do them one at a time. So you go from xt to xt plus one, plus two, plus three. You do them one step at a time, and you just see that your uncertainty grows. We'll get back to that next week. One thing is that we have to assume that the input is known, otherwise we have to kind of start modeling that as well. Now, where does this name come from? Why do we call it Kalman filter? Well, the motivation comes from Rudolf E. Kalman, so he was the one that gave name to this filter, although Tova Nikolai Thiele and Peter Schwerling pretty much did a similar algorithm even before then, but it was Kalman who actually made it very famous and known. 
because of what it did together with NASA in the Apollo program, where when you're sitting there in the capsule, you want to estimate the state of where it is. You get a lot of noisy measurement, but since they're noisy, but on the other hand, you know the physics of the system quite well, so you know the system, so you have a system understanding, and then you have some noisy observations, so you want to somehow get a better estimate of the system state. And that, you can say, where it all really got interest and got popular to some extent. Furthermore, the foundation goes back to the very first lecture on the linear projection. So the linear projection theorem concerns vectors x and y, and where you look at means and variances and covariances are used there, and we called the state x here, is and then we have it observation y, and then we can write down expectations for this just using the linear projection theorem. So how do we do that here? Well, we have to condition on previous values of y, and I see here that we have all, we have a curly, a a curly y here where you have index t minus 1, that means you have all the observation of y up till time t minus 1. So we will look at xt given yt minus 1 and yt given yt minus 1. So maybe I should just flip back now in a moment. Let me just post this. So the expectation of xt given yt minus 1, given yt given yt minus 1, well, you don't have the condition twice on all the previous ones. So we can look at the expectation of x given y. And that is equal, given the linear projection theorem, to the expectation of x plus the covariance between x and y. Here we condition on yt minus 1, the inverse of the variance of y, and then the prediction error that we have out here. And now I think it's a good time to just swap and look at the linear projection theorem that we have the definition here back from lecture one. So what we have here is the expectation of y given x. So the linear projection theorem is the expectation of y given x equals to the mean value of y plus the covariance between y and x times the inverse of the covariance of x times x minus the mean value of x. And now let's go back here and just revisit what we have here. So we have the expectation of x given y we pretty much just have to swap x's and y's everywhere in the projection theorem over here, is equal to the expected value of x, which is mean value of y over here, covariance between x and y, which is the covariance between y and x here, the inverse of x, the inverse of the covariance matrix of x becomes the inverse of the variance of y, and finally the prediction error in y here is from the prediction error in x here. So it is indeed just, what we have here is indeed just the linear projection theorem. And from that comes the variance as well. So you have the variance of x given y is equal to the variance of x. And I'll just not mention all the previous y t minus 1 here. Um, I should mention that, but it just makes things so complicated. So just read it, the understanding is that this variance of x is a covariance of x t uh, y t given the previous and then multiplied by the inverse of the variance of y times the covariance. So again, it's how much do we trust the information from the, from the observation that we got. First, I'll just copy what we had there on the previous slide. And then if we relabel all these things with our notation that we use in the common filler, or just to underline it, then we, what we have here is the expectation of xt given 
yt and all the previous observations. We call that xt given t. That's equal to expectation of xt given the previous observation, so that's xt given t minus 1, plus the covariance between xt and yt given all the previous. That's the covariance between x and y given uh, at time t given t minus 1. Then we have the inverse variance of yt given the previous stuff. That's the sigma yy at time t given time t minus 1 inverse. And then we have the prediction error out here is yt minus yt hat t given t minus 1. Okay, so and then for the covariance here of x t given t, as we have variance of x given yt is equal to the variance of x given up information up to time t minus 1, as we have down here, then minus the covariance between x and y given information up to time t minus 1, we have down here, and then the inverse variance of y given at, at the time t given t minus 1, multiplied by the transpose, the same covariance as before. And now what we'll do is that we'll take this part here, so the one multiplier that we have in front of the prediction error, and we label that the Kalman gain, so to speak. Gain between, between us, that's the amplification you get of the prediction error into the system. So let's just look a little closer at what we have here. Let's just look at sigma xy. What is that? Well, that's the covariance. Now I just forget about the time indices, but we just to get what is happening here, it's a covariance between x and y. So it's the covariance of x, and then we have y defined up here. So we can plug that in. That's c times x plus epsilon 2 here. But since we're looking at the covariance between x and since the noise in the two parts in the, in the system and the observation part are independent. It does not give any contribution. And this is equal to the variance of x c transpose because we have the c multiplied on the last element there. So we have to take it outside transposed. Or you can also write it as sigma x x c transpose. So that means that the Kalman filter, the Kalman gain at time t can be written instead of this notation here, we can have it as sigma x x t given t minus 1 c transpose and then the inverse of sigma y y t given t minus 1 like that. So that's what I find is the most typical way of writing it, but there are many ways to, to write these different sets of equations. It depends on when you write covariances, when you write in a different style. So the common gain is basically saying how much does the one-step prediction error influence when we make the update from getting from t given t minus 1 to t given t. Now, the one-step predictions, we talked about that already, so those are easy. And when we look at the prediction errors, we also get to the covariance structures that we looked at just before. And again, here's the covariance between x and y. And we discussed this already when we postulated the camel filter, so let's just move on from here. <coughs>